Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back. Thank you so much. I have a fantastic guest for you today. With me is Christopher McClellan. He is the owner of the Whole Care Network, where you hear this podcast and many others on caregiving and other care type shows. We are discussing how he thought he knew everything about caregiving from his time being a caregiver until he became somebody who needed care himself and he realized that his education was lacking. So thanks for joining me, Christopher. Jennifer, what a great day to visit with you. Thank you. You're welcome. So why don't you give us your background a little bit? Tell us tell us all about you. Oh my goodness. Well, that'll take about 30 seconds cuz you know, I have I have four older sisters, so I was trained well. So uh <laughs> but actually my four older sisters, that's where I got my care gene from. You know, I, I, I'm known in some circles as the FU. Now your listeners are saying, what the, what, what? Well, if I'm the favorite uncle, I've got 25 nieces and nephews, 40, some odd great, great nieces and nephews. And I think there's a couple of great, great nieces and nephews out there somewhere. It's a, it's a long Christmas list, but, uh, but truly I, I did get my, my care gene from my sister and I, I've been in the, the caregiving space now. Oh goodness. I was thinking about this the other day yeah, for about 20 years uh, as a social worker, church worker in and around senior care. And then um, I became a caregiver for my uh, now deceased partner, Richard Schiffer, who was diagnosed with a esophageal cancer in 2011, given three to four months to live and lived another 29 months uh, afterwards. And I've stayed in as a caregiving advocate, because I think it's through our story sharings where diversity meets the road to collaborate on a common cause. And uh, I've had 300 of my Healing Ties podcast. I've been on numerous podcasts like this, meeting folks that you, you, you know, but you really don't know in one sense. And what I mean by that, it's through, you know, we all understand the journey, all caregivers, there's no strangers when it comes to caregiving. And I have been mentored by some of the best in the, in the, and I say this word lightly in the industry, because it really, in 2023, it is kind of an industry now. It's a niche market, but Amy Goyer, Denise Brown, um, goodness, I could just go through the list in 2011 when we got this diagnosis and they were there for me to help me through the, the journey. And we stay in that uh, as life after caregiving, but uh I have to say, you know, while our story was publicized, uh, I stayed in it. I thought I knew a lot about caregiving, but I really didn't know a lot about caregiving until I needed a caregiver. There was I've those learned, days. Yeah. I'm sorry. I've learned I, from the, from my guests, I've learned more since my mom passed away it, in the beginning of 2020 than I did in the first two and a half, almost three years of podcasting. So the podcast is almost seven years old at the time of recording. So my mom's been gone for three and a half years. So half and half, I've learned a lot. And I think once you're a caregiver, it changes you and you can't just, you can't revert back to the, what you were before because right. there's a lot of reasons that's not an option. Exactly. It, yeah. There's, you know, there's two very common aspects to caregiving. There's a beginning and there's an end. And in most cases, we're not prepared emotionally, physically, spiritually, financially for either one of these life-changing adjustments. And then when you're in after caregiving and you're dealing with the grief, you know, that roller coaster, those peaks and valleys are, are very prevalent. Uh, and you're not in that caregiving community anymore. You're you're in this aftercare community and and that's an area of caregiving that's not given a, enough attention what you do after caregiving ends because your your whole life has changed you know two or more lives have been forever changed when a life transitions and you know you you know this from your experience you know where where do you fit where do you find yourself and podcasting is a great way to do that because you can 
you can walk the talk on one side and you know the experience of what it is on the other side after caregiving ends but i it's it was about two two and a half three years ago where i started having some heart issues um atrial fibrillation there was some nights when uh, i i'd get out of the bed i you know so uncomfortable as he's these part palpitations, you think you're going to have a heart attack, you know, you're doing all. And I left my advanced directives out on the out on the desk numerous times because, well, I was trained to have those, have those close close at hand, because you know, what happens if what happens if you don't wake up? It'd be easier than a lot of a lot of It'd be easier a lot of things, but but you want to make it easier for those people that are entrusted in your care. And having those documents. But for me, when having a heart procedure and coming back from the procedure and, uh, you know, I, I was very diligent. You know, I had all my advanced directives at the hospital. I scheduled the rides to and from. I, you know, I spoke to the nurse and I, I gave them the contact information. I gave, I, you know, I gave everything that they needed. You're probably because a that was patient. my experience. Yeah, I was. Yeah, I was a good. Oh, you're a good patient. Oh, I've done this a lot. Oh, yeah. But then I came home, and I needed help in and out of the bed. I needed help in and out of the shower. I needed help toileting. I needed help people fixing my my meal. And. And I say this in all kindness uh, when I when I say this. Uh, uh, what what happened in that experience is I really got in touch with my mortality, and and it made me think about Richard, my partner Richard, and what he was dealing with with the esophageal cancer and that diagnosis. While we always talked about that, you know, we were together in this and and we were we were fighting this disease together. I, you know what? He was the one taking the medicine. He was the one going to radiation. I was his support. I never had a full grasp of what it was like dealing with a terminal illness or dealing with the fact that you're you've got this cancer and there's no real cure for it. And I never had the experience of losing some of my faculties and having to ask for help and the most mundane things that are, we're so used to doing on a regular basis. And I, and I, and I did a lot of reflection during this time. And I thought, cause I, I would say to Richard, you know, I have all this sage advice. Why isn't he taking it? You know, why isn't he doing all the, you know, uh, and we had the most beautiful relationship that two people could ever have. Um, but as much as I knew what he wanted and as much as most caregivers know what their care partner, and I use the generic term care partner, what they, 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 they they know what that person wants. You really don't know what it's like facing a terminal illness or facing the loss of your capacity to do some basic things until you experience yourself. I've had that experience once. So back in the Wednesday before Memorial Day, 2016, I decided to fly off my bike, which was fine. The flying part was fine. The smashing into the street. Smashing was wasn't so good. Smashing was not. Yeah, so the good. landing was bad. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, for people who ride a bike, this is your PSA to wear a freaking helmet because I cracked <laughs> my bicycle helmet all the way through. Oh goodness gracious, Saint and Ignatius! Knocked, Thank goodness knocked, you had. Yup. I mean, I'm sorry. I got a lot of hair. Bike helmets are ugly. They do ugly things to your hair. I get it. Don't like them, but. That's my PSA. Save your life. Yes, it did. I can only imagine. If it didn't, if I wouldn't have died from that crash, Lord only knows where I would have Lord been. Would but have, I did right. break my collarbone. The one blessing, so to speak, is most of the time when a cyclist breaks a collarbone, they break it on their dominant side because you're reaching out to brace yourself from the impact. And my my impact was too fast. I guess I didn't say I didn't see it coming. <laughs> <laughs> but I couldn't use my left hand. 
thankfully I'm right-handed, but I couldn't use my left hand. And you talk mm-hmm. about needing help toileting yeah. and stuff. Thankfully, I had old, oversized workout shorts that I could yank you up. Could, you could maneuver with, and yeah, one yeah. one hand at a time. And my so I was at the time there was four of four adults in my household, and one day you know part of the way through healing feeling better but not totally with it everybody left <laughs> and i'm like well okay i'll just make myself my own sandwich do you know how hard it is to slather some mayonnaise on a sandwich with one hand it's like not you're easy. pushing the dish all the way around the counter and it's like this is ridiculous maybe i should have just spooned peanut butter out of the jar or something <laughs> i mean it was just it was just crazy and because you're not super needy as Richard probably was, or people like my mom were, you know, I had three adults in my household. They had things to do. They didn't have time right. to sit around and, and right. you know, make me a sandwich or whatever. Uh, my husband did learn how to maneuver the hairdryer while I maneuvered the brush because I was, <laughs> enough he vanity. Gets, I was not some, going. He gets some stars for that. Yeah, fortunately, he didn't have to do the styling, but he did have to, you know, <laughs> keep from burning me with the hair dryer. And then one day I finally, you know, everybody was too busy and I'm like, okay, well, I guess I'll drive myself to the gym. Um, the doctor did say I could continue doing spin just to be careful with balance, which was fine. Balance is always something I've worked on. And my daughter said something and I shrugged my shoulders and it was like, oh, baby, oh. that hurt. <laughs> So it's like, okay, obviously not healed all the way. Um, I have a high tolerance for pain, but it's not, it's, I could not live with pain the rest of my life. And mm-hmm. after, you know, a month or two, I was like, I'm done with this. I'm over this. And I had to tell myself, you know, there's people that live with this kind of pain forever and it's not going to go away. I know it's temporary. And it, it took a lot of mental, mm-hmm. you know, giving myself a pep talk just to keep from being awful. And, you know, I kept saying to myself, you know, other people have it worse. Other people have it worse. And I ended up talking to a gal that was in our Rotary Club. And she said, yep, you're right, because her daughter lost an arm to a lawnmower accident when she was a child. And I was like, I'm really going to try hard not to complain, because that's nasty. (laughs) Yeah, that that, that is very sad. (laughs) Goodness. Yeah. And I think the dad was more... Uh, maneuvering the lawnmower. So it was it was bad all the way around. But oh. yeah, it was like, but it's hard. You know, people have their own lives and they, you know, they don't, you know, you got to go to work, make the money and take care of the responsibilities and they don't stop and go, wait a second, maybe I should make her a sandwich before I go or maybe I should make sure somebody else can drive her to the, you know, it's like these, you know, it's like you don't think of all these things. And no. you know, thankfully for us, it was short lived and that's the only bone I've ever broken in my entire life. So we're going to keep it that way knock now. Knock on wood. <laughs> knock on wood. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> but I, I think we, when we, um, when we've been caregivers and we've been advocating for somebody else, uh, which is which is the most important role that every caregiver uh, has as an advocate. Uh, we, I think oftentimes, and I speak for myself, I'm not going to, sp- <laughs> I've learned over the years not to speak for others, <laughs> but uh, um, uh, I I always wanted to do the best I could for Richard. But I could never really get in touch with what that must feel like to be facing a diagnosis that there was no cure for and to be able to, and have to ask for help in areas. And he was, I mean, he was five foot five. He was a ferocious Manhattan man. Uh, uh, But he was humbled by this experience and he, he fought as long as he could fight and he resisted asking for help for as much as he could. And, my experience kind of allowed me to understand just a little bit what the difficulties in asking for help and recognizing the fact that I needed help and that I was not capable of doing some of the things that I'd been used to doing my entire life. And, you know, we, we kind of, we kind of theorize that we know, 
really what our care partner wants and needs uh, because we're not in their shoes. Um, so it was just, you know, for me, as I've reflected over this, it's like, oh, I mean, I understand. I, I you know, I have a much better understanding why the day I walked home from work, came home from work and the step ladders out and, you know, he was not supposed to get up on any of the step ladders and there was the macaroni all over the floor, you know, cause he had, he had fallen. And because our, our mind tells us that we can still do these things. And we want to do those things. I think it's biological at two. We're like, no, I do it. Uh, right. <laughs> right. Right. It's like, mm -hmm. you can't. Okay. <laughs> but then all of a sudden when you can't do it, the emotional impact that that has, uh, I never was able to get in touch with that until it happened to me. And it just put a whole different perspective on, especially the last six months of his life when he intensely needed needed help, needed help with showering and bathing and toileting and things that we may kind of turned into a joke. So we, <laughs> we had, you know, again, he didn't like to ask for help, but we, we coined a phrase. He'd look at me and he'd say, well, you know, it's uh, time for a pooparama. And that was his way of saying, I, I, I need your help in the, in the bathroom. So we, some days he could get up out of the chair on his own. Some days he needed my help. Um, we would maneuver down to the, the bathroom and uh, he'd sit there and do his business. And I'd stand at the door waiting for my next instruction. But you know what? We had the most beautiful conversations at that time. Because where else could you be so vulnerable? Just the car. And the car. Well, yeah, that could be too. But I don't, I don't uh, know if your mom pulled out those... We need to talk about X while you're driving and you can't escape, or she's driving, you can't escape. <laughs> that would be that would be a moment too. So <laughs> I had a few of those. <laughs> <laughs> On the giving or receiving side. Technically both. I was driving okay. home from work with my daughter who was four about the time. And we we had to drive over a pretty steep hill to get from one city to the next and there was cows and she said um i don't know she must have known the answer when she asked this question she's like uh you know where's hamburger come from and i'm like oh lord you know there's these cute cows right here all around us on our way home and i don't want to turn the child into a vegetarian <laughs> at four <laughs> but i don't want to lie to her so i said well actually you know see the cows i i, I think those cows get turned into hamburger. And she looked at the cows and she looked at me and she goes, cows make good beef. And I was like, oh Lord, okay, phew. <laughs> it's all mission accomplished. Yeah, I'm still not a vegetarian, that kid. <laughs> <laughs> They'll figure out there's now. a process for that cow to get the, the get, to get the beef out of the cows. So. Yeah, so unfortunately she didn't ask any follow-up questions, but you know, yeah, you know, there's, I've been on both ends. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, but again, it's it's those stories that we share. It's these moments that, and I think that's kind of why we all stay in this is to share the stories, because people relate to stories. Whether, uh, you know, whether it's a whatever the diagnosis is or whatever the uh, the dementia is, you know, people relate to the stories because they they can see themselves in it, and the best. I believe uh, the old social worker in me, the best information and referral comes from the stories that we share, especially those stories where people have been in the trenches and uh, that's, that's where you get the authenticity. So I'll never look at a cow differently now though. So, <laughs> Well, it's funny, the older I get, the less beef I'm interested in eating, which I find kind of interesting because it's, Right now, it's more of a choice, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, to have beef, you know, like mm, once or twice a week, twice being max, but it's more of a, I don't know, physio physiological, biological, not sure which one, not a scientist. Um, but I've been eating a lot more vegetarian lately, and I feel better doing it. And I know it's better for my brain, so 
Since my mom had Alzheimer's and her mom had mixed dementia, my maternal great-grandmother had dementia, I don't mind doing some good things for my brain, (laughs) like not slamming into the street. (laughs) Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about Neuro Reserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. Uh, we we have it uh, in um, my father's side of the family um, and we've got it with a couple of my sisters too. So I'm always mindful, <laughs> no, no pun intended. I'm always mindful about... Um, my position with this as a as a single person, you know what, you know what are I, I want to pay attention to the to the signs that I can personally recognize, and I also you know I always tell my friends, you know, if, feel free to if you see something, say something, you know, because you know as a, as a single person, because um, I'm going to get a little emotional here because it kind of it happened to one of my sisters who was single you just you you get the it just progresses without people recognizing it it's easy to dismiss early on it's easy to dismiss early on right and my my listeners know that you know we had a photography studio and one hour photo lab as a family and my parents and i and my mom started taking orders this was back in the 90s When we actually printed from film and real estate appraisers had to have uh, three copies of each picture for the reports that they literally, you know, double-sided sticky tape or glue, glue sticked into a report. I mean, it's like, it doesn't seem like the 90s were that long ago, but (laughs) that seems so really old school these days. I I just pulled out my ceramic Christmas tree in the box in 1995. (laughs) I have one my grandmother made, my maternal grandmother. I lo- I I adore it. Um, but this woman was almost always the recipient of my mom not writing down when she was planning on coming back. Usually it was like a 24-hour turnaround. And this was in the days where, and I half my audience will remember this. The other half is probably still a little young for this. But we were switching from the three and a half by five size that was the standard to the four by six, which I don't even think anybody even knows about those sizes yeah, anymore. <laughs> but the appraiser needed the smaller size to fit on her report, which required changing the big black heavy canister of paper in the machine that did the printing. So it wasn't like, oh, crap, mom forgot to tell us you, when, when you were coming back. Let me just print it really quick. No, it was always a bit more of a process. But it was easy to dismiss because, you know, there was like three of us and the phone rang or the doorbell rang or, you know, whatever. You had to go to the bathroom or all three at once. It was easy to dismiss until she started doing it a lot more often. And then one day she didn't recognize her handwriting, her own handwriting on an order. At that point, I already knew because my grandmother was in the later stages of her. She had vascular dementia, but I've been told that she probably also had Alzheimer's. Um, because of the way the end was. So it wasn't a big surprise, but my mom was really good at denial. So yeah, it's really easy to to dismiss, to ignore, not in a negative way, but you know, just 
we want to be, you know, we try to be positive. We think, oh, well, she's tired, she's stressed, she's distracted. And then then you get that Tuesday afternoon phone call that upends your life. Yeah. Yeah. So what would you do, knowing what you know now from both sides of the caring, needing care and giving care, what would you advise caregivers, especially those who are in the earlier stages, even the later stages probably, but what would you advise them to, how would they, how would you suggest they kind of like mentally proceed with the knowledge that you're sharing? I hope that made sense. Well, I, I, no, I get it. Uh, I, um, a couple of things, one or one's kind of standard, uh, you know, find that, that comfort zone where you can, uh, set a daily intention for yourself to, you know, that, the uh, I don't use the word self-care anymore. I, I use the word self-compassion where you can find that, uh, you know, find the moments to where you're um, um, comfortable with yourself and taking care of yourself. But I think the, I, I think really the important thing here is be mindful that you're the co-pilot. You're not the one taking the medicine. You're not the one going to the treatments. You, you are. You're. You're. You're being the supporter. You're probably going there, but find that that comfort zone and knowing that in your role as an advocate, as much as you think that of what you know what about your care partner, it's really hard to know what they're dealing with until you've been in their shoes you know take take a you know take a day and think about what it must be like to ask somebody to help them toileting not everybody can do that toileting is one of the <laughs> you know we made a joke out of it but not everybody can can toilet can help somebody with toileting you know what where's Find the role that you feel comfortable in and then find that help on your care team for those roles that you can't really do or don't want to do. But be mindful that what you're going through as a caregiver, as hard as it is, is much different than what your care partner is going through. That's probably very true. As my mom got in the later stages of Alzheimer's and didn't seem to understand that she had any kind of significant issue whatsoever, I think it got harder to understand that or, well, you know, to remember that. Because, uh, and, I, and I, I, I wasn't a caregiver for anybody with dementia. I've, I've got a couple of sisters, tried to help a little along the way, but, you know, the story still resonate because we always want our care partner, our loved one to be well, like they were, you know, I'd like to have, I'd love to have Richard back. It's, we're approaching 10 years. Um, I don't want him back the, the last, the way he was the last six months, but when we're in the middle of it, um, uh, we don't recognize those changes that uh, that happen subtly on a day to day because we're intensely involved with this person and we don't see those changes. And that's why it's so important to have an objective third person involved who you can trust and allow them to say to you what needs to be said that, you know, this person person this is my observation usually is like oh no he he could do all those things oh, no. having that objective third person come in that's trust that you trust to help you assess what's really going on with your care partner will go a long way in um making a difficult situation just a little bit easier uh, and i learned the hard way Asking for help is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of help. It's a, it's a sign of strength. Uh, but we think our caregiving capes can do it all. 
yet uh, we forget about the emotional impact and we're trying to deal with somebody that we've known for X amount of years in this previous role and their life is totally different from what that is. But they're trying to live that life. They're trying to, they're trying to do the toileting. They're trying to get up on the ladder to grab the, to grab the, the macaroni so they can make their own dinner. Uh, um, just, you know, be conscious of those, of those moments. And um, I, I, I guess the, the, the word that's coming is be, it, is be self-aware that, yeah, be self-aware that your talents and skills as a caregiver, as good as you are, there's always somebody there that can help and see it from a different position that will help you um, not only in your role as a caregiver, but when you need care, because we'll all, all of us are going to need care at one point. Yeah, I'm fun at parties because I like to bring up the statistic that 70% of us will need care before we die. And before <laughs> you think that you're going to be part of that 30%, that's crazy people like me that fly off bicycles without helmets and or die in car accidents or die suddenly from a disease. Just because 30% of people don't need care doesn't mean they, they live to 100 and went to sleep and never woke up. I have a friend that she's – I'm working on her, but – <laughs> oh, goodness. I, and again, that's another example about why we stay in it because of our experiences. You know, it's one thing to type in Dr. Google and get all these, uh, you know, all these different websites and all these, but I, you know, I come back to my pet phrase. It's through story sharing where diversity meets the road to collaborate on a common cause. And, uh, and that's why I think folks like us, and after caregiving, stay in it to, to provide those stories to people who are coming before us to in their care journey. Yeah, I've been doing this long enough. I have to remind myself that there's people out there, maybe new new listeners, maybe this is their first episode. They don't know 90% uh, of the I, stuff I know. <laughs> I, I know I'm not the host today, but I'm going to ask, I'm going to pretend I'm the host and I, I'll ask my guest, but I always ask my guest, Jennifer, have you met anybody that's had caregiving on their bucket list of things to do in life? And I, I it, no, but it's a, it's an untimely diagnosis. It's an unfortunate accident. You know, suddenly you're thrust into it. And most people that are thrust into it are not, well versed in the uh, the legal system, the medical system, the social service system, uh, the clergy system, all those support systems that you need uh, in order to uh, do the best you can in this uh, in this very intense but meaningful role. Uh, I I have been corrected though. I think I've had listeners tell me, well, you know, I. I decided to be a caregiver because my partner or my spouse was handicapped when I when we connected. And I thought, oh, I, my heart goes out to them. That the yes, there are people who choose that because of that type of. But the majority of people, majority of caregivers are thrust into this at a moment's notice, and it's usually an emergency situation. And what happens when you're in an emergency trying to make decisions? <laughs> uh, I, I can I can share all my stories of, of the bad decisions I made in the midst of an emergency because I didn't know. And you think back when we started in this, um, I think I did my first podcast in 2012. Uh, you think what's, how the internet has changed uh, the information. There wasn't really, wasn't a whole lot out there on caregiving in 2011. When I started my show, so I started taking care of my mom in early 2017. So my dad died March 2nd, 2017. I mean, we'd already been doing this for what felt like forever between her <laughs> and my grandmother. You know, I wasn't clueless, but when I didn't have my dad as a buffer, it was like, holy Toledo, there, this is, woof. And the biggest difference between then and now is when I started my show in 2018, so I started researching and planning 
end of 2017 into early 2018, launched May 5th, May, May 1st, 2018. So in that six month time period, you did not share your loved one with dementia on social media. <laughs> period. That was a no, no. That was the way you would have gotten canceled. They would have flamed you. If they could have found you, they would have tarred and feathered you. I mean, it was absolutely no. And now people do it every day, all day long, which is fine. I don't have any problems with it at all. I'm just kind of jealous because I don't have that much to share. I don't have that many photos or videos yeah. of my mom because yeah. I was very circumspect on what I did share because I was trying to make sure that I was being respectful of her. So that's a right. huge difference. And I've seen a big shift in, you know, like the stigma is, is going away. There's more knowledge. There's more sharing. But on the periphery, there's more research in different right. areas. I've talked to researchers. like, And I've talked to doctors. I've talked to people who I never thought I would talk to. And it's so it's it's comforting that things are changing. I just wish it would change a lot faster. Right. <laughs> and and there's a whole, and I, again, I say this very kindly. Remember, I have four older sisters. I'm not saying you're older, but I'm just saying uh, I, I, <laughs> that uh, in this whole network of care and how it's uh, changed over the last uh, few years, especially since COVID, there's a whole new set of leaders that are that are coming up into the uh, into the care space with all the different forms of technology and you got AI and all that. But again, I, I, I still think it's all always going to come back to our stories and sharing, sharing the experience that we've all had and the, what worked, what didn't work and how to make life better for both the caregiver and the care partner. And that's why you're doing what you're doing. I love the question. Are you concerned AI will can replace your job? No. <laughs> AI can't be a caregiver and they can't share all the caregiver stories like you and I do. So That's right. maybe someday, mm -hmm. but we'll see. Like I said, I plan on living to 103 like my paternal grandmother did. Just 46 years, you people can do the math. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not shy about my age because I haven't had a perfect year yet. So I got to keep trucking and find one. But there you said something that I really liked because it it brings up a situation that I see quite a bit is you said that our caregiving cape isn't always big enough. Mm -hmm. And I have run across caregivers whose parents, it's usually a parent. Um, I haven't, it, it could include a spouse, but usually it's a parent who refuse outside help and assume that their usually daughter can do it all and there's just, it's all bad from, that. you know, it's like, that's starting off on the wrong foot. And I, I like the knowledge of having a third party that can help you, that can observe through different eyes, you know, like I'm sure most people can relate to this one. You know, you lose some weight, you don't see it in the mirror. You might see it in your clothes, not being as right. snug or your pants are starting to slide down to your knees but mm -hmm. you don't really see it in the mirror because every day there's just this little tiny change and you don't even notice it. Now, I lost over 100 pounds and that's a really Congratulations. interesting- Thank you. Kept it off too, most of it. Mm -hmm. um, so far, so good. It's been 10 years. Oh my Lord, more than 10 years. Um, <clears throat> but I actually went through like a body dysmorphia period where what I saw in the mirror did not remind me of myself. It was like, it was like looking at somebody different and that was weird, you know? So it's like, I could understand people that actually have a clinical diagnosis of that problem, but you know, when we're taking care of a loved one, we don't notice those subtle changes. Like you said, I think, no. I really think that's, um, that's a, that's a nugget that people need to keep in their, the back of their mind because there could be changes that you miss that are important to, to not miss. I'm sure exactly. You, you just because you're 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 there every day. You see it. You your 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 routine it might be a little bit different, but you don't. You see the person every day. You don't notice those subtle changes. And I think that, you know, the thing for me, 
because I, <laughs> two days before he died in the hospice, I'm thinking he's coming home because that was the plan. He always got better. I mean, I'm talking to the doctor, you know, this didn't happen. This didn't, you know, we were going home. And you know, it's like when the doctor looked at me, the two doctors looked at me, said, you know what? We don't know how, how this man has lived as long as he's lived, considering the amount of cancer that's it that's inside of him it's the it's a testament to the love and care that the two of you have for each other that you live that long and it's like oh, 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 oh okay <laughs> so because i never recognized it i you know i, I can't say i never rec i mean i knew there was there was levels and that's another thing that i'd want to i'd, I'd want to share with your listeners there's always a level there's always a, a plateau your care partner will always get to a plateau they might stay at that plateau for a, a while, but there might be a day or two where it's going to get better, but it never gets better. I'm not trying to be harsh. I'm just trying to be reality. It plateaus. The plateau very rarely goes up for an extended period of time. The plateau only goes down. And I, I'm only saying that, not not in a, in a mean way. I'm just saying that, that that's just the reality of, of these care situations. We want everybody to be as healthy and happy as possible, but we have to be realistic. And when you're emotionally involved with something, someone like I was and like millions of caregivers are, um, that that's kind of the reality. And I, I, you know, in the the shocking thing for me after he died, you know, we were fortunate. We had our story told by a local newspaper who was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. I mean, it's it kept me in this. It, the only thing different, there's nothing different about our story than anybody else's. It was just publicized. But you know, those reporters followed us for seven months. They took over a thousand photos of us. And I got the photos that weren't published. And I was and over the years, I was able to look at those photos from September of 2013 when they started following us to March 9th of 2024 when he died in 2014. <laughs> uh, and I look at that. I, I, I can't believe how sick this man was and how I didn't even, how jaundiced he was. How, I, I, I didn't, I never noticed it because those are those subtle changes that go on during a diagnosis that the, that the main caregiver often doesn't see. And that's why I stay in this because I, I hope that I can just touch just one person that didn't have to go through what I went through by sharing the story. Cause we, you know, the journeys are all different, but um, when emotions play a role in, in your experience, you know, that by sharing your experience, you can help somebody else just uh, just a little bit. And that's that's why we do what we do. Very true. Where can people find more of you on the internet? Well, uh, they can go to uh, a few places. They can go to thewholecarenetwork.com and they can look for Christopher McClellan. You can also see all of our podcasts, especially this uh, wonderful Fading Memories podcast. Uh, you can check out the uh, My Green Folder uh, film project on mygreenfolderfilm.com. Uh, it's a film project that's in the works for our uh, about our story. And you can see my new Aging Gayfully brand on uh, aginggayfully.com. I've got my I got my hands involved in a lot of things in my late 60s. What's going on here? <laughs> so <laughs> Hey, if you're going to live long like I plan on it, you got to got to do something. Can't uh, just I, uh, I, sit around, you know. I, I, can't I, just sit around and watch TV. That's boring. No, I'm not sit around and listen to podcasts. There we go. <laughs> I get a little out of sorts when my like daily news podcast you know like they took off wednesday thursday friday for thanksgiving they take off other How dare i guess they're federal holidays <laughs> yeah it's like i don't take time off what's <laughs> what's what i like i need this so it's, it's or in one of my other there's a favorite I, for the dog lovers out there there's the golden ratio podcast independent um mostly they talk about dogs golden golden retrievers 
And they skipped a week because she had book launch and she was racing all over the country. Um, they're in the her, Keys, so they're not her, terribly her, far from you. Her cape is limited, too. Yeah, and it was like, I knew, I'm like, they didn't come out with a podcast this week. Well, I'm sure it's because of the book launch, but they didn't come up with a show this week. <laughs> it was like, please don't mess with my system. <laughs> they're messing with my system, so. Um, and all your all your listeners can listen to the podca- your podcast on the Whole Care Network and our new streaming radio app, which has been a soft launch and it's kind of going well, but it's, it's not going to be really in full, full bloom until, uh, until next year, but it's, it's fun. It's fun learning another medium to get the message out to folks. And I appreciate, I appreciate you being a part of the network. Well, thank you very much. And when Christopher says next year, he is talking about 2024, which is when this episode will come out. So you guys will <laughs> well, for sure check that out. I know this is like, we're almost at December 1st to 23. So <sighs> it's been a year already. And next been year, a year already. Be... And we'll more things to come in 2024. Can we just skip it? <laughs> <laughs> Move on to 25. So <laughs> I don't know. That might not be any better. Well, I appreciate this very much. I hope people make sure you tune into the whole care network because um, one of my past guests, Elizabeth Miller, is on there. Christopher's on there. There's, I'm sure there's other people that I've talked to that are on there. And that's just where you can get to find all the good stuff. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of great podcasters on the network. And check out our Whole Care Network University. And there's just a lot of stuff to get involved in. So, But thank you for what you do, Jennifer. Thank you so much for helping me. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.